right, welcome to the OKD working group meeting for April 12th of 2015. Let's take a quick look at the agenda and let me know if there's anything you want to change, add, or remove. It's not 2015 though, but what's that? Everything else is fine. What's that? It's not 2015. Can you can you hear me? Does it? Yeah. Can you hear me? Where does it say 2015? Uh, you said 2015. It's oh, 2022. I did? But I think oh, you know that. 2022, yeah. yes. Sorry, April 12th, 2022. <clears throat> Where did that come? 2015. I don't know. We're doing the time warp. Yeah, right. Exactly. <clears throat> Folks, they may have to jump off in a hurry. I'm having some uh, real world production issues, but they haven't told me I have to join yet. So. Okay. Do you, is there anything that you want us to bump up so that you can talk about it now in case you do have to jet? Um, I mean, there's a couple of things that I'm working on. Uh, I've been working on with Christian um, and Vadim a little bit, uh, trying to get a couple of things fixed. Um, that's pretty much it with the installer. I think it's the uh, the installer issue. I think is a blocker for the next release, at least on vSphere. Um, but I'll let Christian and Vadim. Um, indicate whether that's actually the uh, an issue or not um but other than that i mean i think we've gotten a, a lot of bug squash that we've been looking at um did send some uh a pull request to brian for some build information uh so he can try to take a look at it and see about you know building a new release and stuff like that um which i said i was going to do so i did uh, i think that's it for me so um, Christian you have anything on that um, yeah regarding that um, well I think it's all the the DNS search domain right and, and it pops up in various places yeah. uh, so I open a a system DR to make that behavior configurable that was rejected but there's now another way we could uh, we could do it uh, by by kind of having a a kernel argument, a systemd kernel arg mm -hmm. that would let you define the the DNS search domain uh, at at provisioning time, essentially passing it into uh, the kernel command line directly. That would help. I think the other one you mentioned, the other thing, the other PR you opened, um, is kind of dealing with the same problem, but it's doing it later. It sets the DNS search domain as a network manager dispatcher script, which should also work. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm fine with doing it that way. We'll have to see what the installer folks um, say there, but uh, I, I'm fine with that approach too. I think we should definitely also do this thing. And I've actually, I've actually got my team to, uh, to allow me to work on, on that system directly. So I'm going to be spending oh, a few cool. seconds on that. system D, cool. uh, which is, you know, I haven't done that too much, uh, too much. So, um, I'll be I'll be working on that. Uh, it's that are obviously things that aren't going to be landing immediately, so they'll take time. And I think in the time being, hopefully, I'm I'm not sure what the like this uh, workaround uh, service unit we have whether that now works. Uh, I think the latest iteration isn't in the current payload. I'm I'm not sure about that though. Um, so we we'll see. Uh, I am planning on doing a an OKD release for the first time this week. Uh, Vadim is currently taking a break from OKD, yeah. so that is kind of on me. We we did fix the the issue that we had regarding upgrades, so hopefully that is all on back and we can cut a new release. But I'm not sure about the the specific issue. Um, I do hope our workaround works now efficiently. Um, so the I think the installer yeah. issue for vSphere IPI, I think that's a blocker for a new release. So if we can, if we have a way to push that with the installer team, it doesn't affect OCP. It only affects um, OKD. So maybe we can use that as a as a push thing. It's a blocker. It, there, there's a lot of process involved. So we will obviously push that into master first, and then we'll need to backport it to 4.10 branch, and that definitely requires a bugzilla um, connected to it. Uh, we we can put on the bugzilla. We, we can. Uh, say this OKD specific and it'll it'll pass, but we still need the engineers mm -hmm. um, that own the installer to 
yeah, to, to kind of say this looks good to me. I, I'll be following through with that though. So hopefully, okay. yeah, if, if that really ends up blocking us, um, I doubt there will be a release this week, but if it doesn't, we will hopefully have a release by end of the day after. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely follow up with you on that. and, and Cool. That's all I got. Can one of you I think put I'm... the link? Can one of you put the link to the issues, links to the two issues, uh, in the um, meeting minutes, um, under the OKD release updates section? Yes. Awesome. Um, John, if you could paste the link to your PR uh, yep. there, and I will put one in uh, for the PR that I opened that was rejected. All right. Well, Thanks. Christian, what else do you have in terms of release news? Yeah, not a lot there. Um, yeah, in terms of release news, uh, really just uh, we have fixed, uh, I think, the blocker that we had. Um, so a new release should be possible now. I haven't been, like, I, I've never done a new release. Uh, Vadim uh, thankfully wrote up uh, this uh, this operating, like, release operating, standard operating procedure. Um, that I'll be following, and I will tackle that first thing tomorrow. So hopefully by end of day tomorrow, there's going to be another release. Um, but you know, uh, we'll see by then. That's, um, that's you know, we we support and, you. And we understand that you're helping give Vadim a break, and so it's appreciated whatever you can do. And there, which isn't really specific to to the next this next release, there has been some some talk internally about how we could make OKD fit in better with the whole OpenShift development model. I don't really want to talk too much about it because it was eternal and there hasn't been, haven't been any decisions um, been, been made um, as of today, but there will probably be some changes coming and hopefully that will make OKD fit in much better with how OpenShift as a whole is being developed and will make, um, let's say, the the way from from OKD operating system to RHEL CoreOS will make that um, feedback loop much shorter and much, just much better and will enable uh, external to Red Hat folks uh, to contribute in, in, meaning, in a meaningful manner uh, much more than, than all of you have been able to because I, I know it's been hard. Um, to contribute or even just to rebuild the things. Um, and I think that will be easier in the future, but I, I can't really tell you any details. I'm, yeah, not yet. There, there will be more on this soon. Awesome. All right, great. Uh, up, uh, up next is uh, Fedora Core OS News. Everything. Yes. Right. Um, so I've written in the notes most of the details and the links, essentially on the Fedora Core side. We are moving to Fedora 36, so well in advance. OKD is not moved yet to 35, and uh, we're not moved to 36 really soon. But still, we don't stand still, and uh, we look at the 36 release, which is now in beta and will be released in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we are having a test uh, week. We were having a test week test day last week, but uh, if you're interested, it's, it's still possible to take part into the testing phase. Um, testing Fedora Core's next stream, which is based on 36. Uh, so yeah, do feel free to chime in. The timeline for the rebase is in the third link. Uh, apart from that, we've we are uh, planning to remove uh, the libvarlig utils from Fedora Core. Uh, essentially, if you don't know what that is, then probably you don't need to care, uh, unless uh, you are explicitly using that. Then you probably won't mind us removing it. So just a heads up. It was used in the past by Podman, but it's not used anymore. Uh, then uh, we have a small change that is coming to the way we 
specify the format, uh, the, the, the version compatibility that we specify for VMware images. So the VMware platforms themselves are going end of life some point later, I think it's this year. I don't remember the exact dates, but some versions are soon to be end of life. Uh, and uh, those versions were preventing us from increasing uh, the hardware version in uh, our VMware images. And so once those platforms will be end of life, we will update the version. And so this will, like the default images have become, uh, will require you to use the VMware version higher. Uh, it's not completely blocking. If you're still using an, an older version, you can still use those images. You just have to do a small manual change uh, with those images. Uh, everything is linked in the documentation. Uh, it's not the end of the world. It's just by default, it might not work on older version now. Well, not now, but soon. Uh, and finally, uh, we have VirtualBox images coming soon, so they are not fully displayed yet into all the interface. Probably they will be in the next release or, or, or the one right after, but you can uh, have a look and give them a try if you want to try VirtualBox images of a RockOS. And that's about it for me for this week. Excellent. Are there any questions on the Fedora Core OS stuff that was just covered? Any questions or comments? All right. We have a comment in the chat about woohoo <laughs> for the uh, virtual box images. That is good news. All right. Let's move on now to docs updates with Brian. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we had um, docs meeting last week. Um, okay, so the first one is to do with the community um, repo. We have a community repo um, in the OpenShift GitHub org, which is just called a community. Um, we've moved some of the pieces across. Um, the proposal is that we do not continue the membership. So currently there is an, a reasonably out of date membership list of the working group in that community repo so we thought well at the minute we're not to a stage yet we actually have official membership of the working group um but in so we should drop the membership list as it stands and we do need to actually make sure that we list the officers for each working group because that is a requirement in the charter so in each working group section on the okd.io, we will list the working group officers. Um, um, yeah, I think that was that. So if there's any thoughts on that or any um, discussion, disagreement, um, that's a proposal. Um, and just for a little more context, uh... Yeah, Timothy, you should be on the on one of the lists. Yeah, I, I, um, we'll, we're going to update that. I don't think I'm that. on any of the membership. I don't think I'm on any of the membership lists either. It right. Is on Neither am I. Yeah, so we'll we'll take care of that. The other thing is that um, in terms of the, and we'll talk about this later. In terms of the officers, chairs of the subgroups will be denoted, and we have to vote on that. Um, or we're going to take a vote. Yeah, ultimately, it's up to the chairs of the main group, but we'll take a vote from uh, amongst the chairs and get the feedback from the greater group at large about who should be chairs of these subgroups. It's pretty straightforward, I think, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, one of the other things that came out of the docs meeting was um, that the meeting minutes are going to go into the website. So I ran it by Brian. You know, what's the best place? And it seems like breaking it off of the HackMD for each meeting and creating individual pages um, going into the site for that is good because then you can point people directly into a particular meeting um, and not make it a really long uh, page. I'm looking to automate this, so I actually started messing around a little bit with pulling from the HackMD, um, you know, having delimiters pulling and then um, putting in uh, um, uh, merge requests. And so I'll be fixing that automation a little bit better. Um, and hopefully um, it'll be 
functional probably within the next week or two. So we'll have an automated way of our meeting minutes getting up to the to the website. Um, okay, so Brandon um, has been looking at the styling. Um, I'm waiting on a pull request to actually update that. Um, there is a link in the um, documents HackMD. I'll post it in chat, but if you, if you go to the HackMD for the um, document working group, you will actually see that there. So that is the prototype of the new styling. Um, the dark hasn't changed that much. The light has had bigger changes. Um, look and feel is pretty much the same, but it's a lot easier to read, a lot more accessibility um, verified, um, and I think it looks quite nice. Um, so I'm waiting for that to go live. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so then we've actually started pulling some technical documentation together, really following on from the discussion we had two weeks ago in this meeting. Um, I'm actually doing it on a fork in my repo just to actually get stuff going. Um, and that's, that's where John's put the um, pull request. Again, the link is in the docs meeting groups. I've posted it here as well. Um, one of the challenges that we're, that we're finding is that there's a lot of undocumented steps. Um, so when I try to go through just pulling from the links that um, Almico provided and looking what was in the various places, one of the big challenges we got that most of the registries have the Docker file starting at an internal image that isn't in the public domain. So John's actually done a pull request where he sort of said registry CI openship org slash origin slash 4.10 base. Um, we should replace the internal image with that one. Again, I can't see that documented anyway, so it'd be good if we put it, in, put it on our site. Um, we need to obviously a way to keep that up to date. So the version of Go, Golang changes or any updates to OKD's base. Um, just really need to work out um, how we keep this up to date. Um, Aniko, you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to respond a little bit about the images thing. Um, you know, so our team, like the cloud team, if you look at like machine API operator, we've tried to maintain two sets of Docker files. You know, we have one called Dockerfile.rel that we use for like the actual release stuff, and then our regular Docker file is like the public. You know, anyone in the community can build it. We've tried to share that pattern with other teams internally, but I think, um, you know, John, you opened up an issue, I think, on the MCO repo, and that that actually caused a discussion internally because Kirsten, uh, the person who was looking at that on the MCO repo, was like, are we even supposed to be doing this? So there is, like, a question internally about, like, should we be creating these Docker files? And, like, although our team has taken it upon themselves to do this, this is not guidance across the board. Um, so I would just like kind of, I guess, like maybe say be cautious a little bit if you're gonna go open up a bunch of issues on the project repos, because many teams aren't aware that this is even like, uh, you know, something they should be doing. So just FYI. Is, is there any uh, route that we could actually question that as a sort of strategy? So from the Red Hat strategy team to say that that would be a good strategy as an open source community, because, I mean, open, OCP is meant to be an open source project as well. Um, but if, if you can't build it because all the source isn't there, then I, is it, do we have a route to actually raise that with this sort of st the strategy team with Red Hat? Christian, go ahead. Hi, Christian. Hi. I think that that's a great idea. Uh, and, and to add what uh, Mike just said, so these Docker files, they aren't actually the, the, the from directives in the Docker files, the actual image references, they aren't the canonical place to store them. They are actually, uh, there, there's those are the, the references CI uses. So whenever CI changes to newer version, um, some CI bot will open a PR to update that that image reference. So they aren't actually, and, and they are kind of being replaced on the fly by CI anyway. They're not okay. the canonical images that are always used if they're in the file. So being being the non-canonical, they're just kind of 
kept in sync on a, on a best effort basis, I'd say. Um, being that, I would think we, we have a good argument to say, look, we, we don't want these weird internal names to pop up there. We might as well just have some, some externally, externally available images there because we always replace those image references in our CI builds anyway. So um, I think that would be a good argument to make and making that I, w I, I have already like this is on my list um, uh, as, as I think I told you, uh, John, uh, that um, there might be a possibility to do this. But yeah, we'll have to discuss that internally. Uh, I'll, I'll have to bring it up on the mailing list and there will be a discussion and stuff. But if you could also, and I think that's a great idea, kind of uh, approach that from the outside and say, look, we, we already have an engineer internally who says, look, these aren't the canonical image names, uh, they're being replaced. And it would just be so much easier for everybody on the outside if they were publicly pullable uh, image references. So could we just make the default to be those public images instead of the internal ones? Um, I think that would be a great argument to make. And if we kind of uh, stick up here on, on right now on this, you do it from the outside through the whatever else. That, 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 that's that's going to be my question. That was going to be my question. Yeah. Where do we actually put that? Because we could actually put do a pull request on individual repos, but is there a a public forum that the strategists t talk about OpenShift in? Or is is there not a, really a channel that we have to actually make that? Right, right. That's what I wanted to get back to was like your original question, which is like, <laughs> how do we make that communication happen? And I don't, I don't think there's actually a good place to do that right now. And I think that's something that like probably Christian and myself and, you know, we should probably raise internally to say, okay, we've got this great meeting. We've got this great community that's growing and growing and growing. Yeah, like how do we make that connection? I see Neil's recommending the matrix room, you know, like, yeah, like if there are red headers who want to hang out there and be part of that, I think we probably need like an official forum or something where it's like, yeah, like if you want to make a request, it's there, it's out in public, everyone can go look at it, vote on it, do whatever. Um, and I just, don't, I don't think we have that currently. I mean, is this something that we need to get Diane engaged on as a community manager to actually push it in yeah, from definitely. a community point of view as well? Okay, so yeah, for sure. next time Diane's she, on, we'll... Yeah, like her, her, like her spice would definitely help out internally getting this kind of moved through the process. Like Christian and I can bark about it all day and then people will just be like, yeah, yeah, go, go fix some bugs or something. Okay, that's yeah, great. I would then... rather have that than about than have you know thirty five different pull requests put into each sub project and you know inside of. Open well, project. right, yeah. So the other side of this is, yeah, you could go through and just open up pull requests and create Docker Docker file .okd in every repo. But the problem is that's not going to really solve the issue because what no. what Christian's talking about is like using the public images, allowing CI to automatically updating them so they're always fresh, it's not a maintenance burden. And then, yeah, we can all just use the same images to kind of build from there. You know, like I, I, I think right. that's actually got the most, like that's what we should be doing. These, you should just be able to build these no matter who you are, right? Agreed. Okay, I mean, great. the workaround now is you replace them, but you have to make sure that when you do your pull requests that you undo those Docker files so they don't get put into your pull request. Right, right. And like <laughs> and like I said, our team maintains two two sets of Docker files, but we've had issues in the past where we rev a new version and someone goes and forgets to update the community Docker file. Now it's got an old version of Golang on it or whatever. You know, like we don't want to create that burden for ourselves, right? Yep. And, and, and those kinds of community specific Docker files, they already exist in a couple of places. Like I think you're the, the only team that uh, just made them, uh, but there's other other teams that I pushed them, you know, I, I pushed a community Docker file onto them because we needed an ironic OKD specific file. Mm -hmm. And they are mostly in, like in some cases, obviously there are specific things, but really, what we are using in that place is just a CentOS stream base. And that that should really just work for our CI as well. So I think eventually we really want to improve our CI as well to just use the same images. And then we have this internal second build system for, for building the actual release payloads of OCP or OpenShift anyways, um, while we in, in OKD land just use 
the, the builds from our CI system. Um, so really, I think moving that the, these image bases to, to just a central stream base uh, would would maybe even work even for for the for CI that we already have without because the, right now these images can't be publicly distributed because they they aren't just the UBI base that is publicly available they are also they also contain some some RPMs that uh, come from from a rail YAM repository. So we can't just uh, make them publicly uh, available without a subscription because everybody loves yep. subscription. Um, so <laughs> I, mean, I think improving um, the yeah. communication is the key here because like what's missing. I, and, wait, everybody and, loves subscriptions. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, what, everybody what's loves missing? subscription manager and subscriptions. Yeah. No, don't don't we all? So, but yeah. um, we, we we just have to make the same default. Of, of being open, I think, here. And I, I think that's a valid and good argument. And I think um, our well, management will also understand that because it's much, much easier uh, for external people also to help us with our work if they can actually uh, build the stuff themselves without having to figure out, okay, this this image reference I can't pull, what, what else do I use that actually has the, the very similar, if not the same contents um, but I, I think I think that's the problem, Christian. We can't even see what the spec of that image is, so there's no way for a community member to work out. We can probably get it working, but we we might be building on totally different versions of the of the underlying sort of language libraries, which means any pull requests we do then may fail, and behave differently when you do an official build. I think that that's that's the biggest issue. Of just trying to, if we can build on the same underlying base image or a very similar one, then it makes the pull request a little bit more valid. Uh, absolutely, and and that's why I would argue this should be sent to our stream for everything, and then we can we can always relate our internal rel builds to a set, a specific sent to stream thing, or you know just compare the versions and. On the outside, you would just be able to to build it with with the CentOS stream. Uh, and we're base. talking about the containers, right? Like the ones that actually make up the stuff yeah. inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes sense to me. Like, uh, let's not try to hurt ourselves by trying to use rel UBI unless the rel UBI the rel container group has decided we're going to make it not hurt ourselves trying to use rel UBI. Like, you know, if, if they decide to go through you know, I know Scott McCarty has mentioned it a bunch of times that he um, that we may see like a, a large expansion of the content available in in the rel UBI thing to cover like full user space and just not include things like the kernel bootloaders, other things that make it useful for it to run as a as a as a real operating system. Um, if that actually happens, then like full steam ahead, rel UBI, all the things, but uh, Otherwise, I think it's super reasonable for us to just do send all stream. And it also provides us an avenue to do um, something that we don't currently do right now. We don't currently um, make it so that th those containers that are built, um, we can't pre-qualify, you know, what changes are coming into the platform for that stuff. Using CentOS stream gives us an avenue to do that and provide some added value in the OpenShift pipeline, which ideally makes them care a little bit more about us. So I think that that makes sense as well. Yeah, I mean, it all make all this makes sense to me. I think the, the real issue again, like there's like a communication that needs to happen internally. Like, like when I talk to developers inside Red Hat, you know, there's kind of like a bifurcation, right? Some developers are totally on board when you talk about open source and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, we're building this open source stuff, but the community can't build it. And they're like, oh, that's a big problem. And others just aren't even aware that this is happening. So like there needs to be a shift in mentality on the way the development teams internal to Red Hat kind of look at this and they need to accept the kind of notion of, okay, we're gonna build these things in a community centric way so that anyone can build them and get out of this notion of like, okay, what is subscription based? What is not subscription based? But I think, you know, obviously, Christian, myself, Diane, we'll have to take that message forward. But I think that's a big part of what's going on here is people just don't know. Which you got to okay. say is kind of funny for for Red Hat being a an open source company. 
<laughs> I, oh, I right, like, kind of ironic. Right. <laughs> well, no, right. I just had this conversation the other day with someone, and they're like, and I'm like, you know, you can't build this Docker file can't be built unless you're on the, you know, unless you're logged in. And they're like, is is that a problem? And I was like, uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> And anybody else want to on this one before we move on? Okay. Um, and then just just the last thing on the technical document. Um, <clears throat> we also discussed um, creating automated test scripts and frameworks. And um, one of the big challenges that we've ever since I've joined the community, and um, we've been trying to get the community to do more testing. So we thought that if we can actually either document or provide some automated scripting. Jamie gave us a link to a library that he worked on a while ago. Um, I'll put that in the chat. It's again, if you want it, it's in the HackMD for the documentation working group um, on the last meeting, um, which was dated the 5th of April. Um, so again, I think that's, that's something else we want to work on to actually document how you can test releases, and then hopefully more of the community will be able to help us out there. Um, there was a, there's been a request for especially bare metal. I think um, obviously VMware, um, Vert, um, as well, community members have access to, to resources there. So um, that was the last piece for that. And I think that's all we covered at the meeting. Yeah, and just to riff on um, what Brian said, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is upgrades. A lot of folks had issues with upgrades from 4.8 to 4.9 because of the um, that change in the cloud operator, right? So there, it, it's shifted from being, yeah, Bruce, I think you had an issue with this, right? It went from being the, the the cloud, what is it, cloud controller operator. It went from being cloud controller to cloud controller operator namespace or something like that. And there were some other issues with um, the replica set that I had not actually spinning up the pods correctly. And that got me to thinking is we don't actually have any documentation anywhere where if someone's performing an upgrade and it starts to fail, where do they look? They don't know the various namespaces and operators to look at when an upgrade fails. I think that would be helpful because a lot of times we get um, tickets coming in that are like, yeah, I did this upgrade from 4.8 to 4.9 or 4.7 to 4.9 or whatever, and I'm stuck, it's just not doing this. And there are some basic troubleshooting steps that we could share with people and showing folks how to pivot, you know, to get onto a new release and stuff like that. If we actually documented some of that stuff, I think it would lighten the burden on folks in the chat um, and some of the discussion messages that we get and might build up um, more people willing to contribute because they start sort of getting into some of the details of actually how OKD operates. So just a thought on that. Uh, does, uh, oh, Shri, oh. yeah, Shri, go ahead. Go right. just say it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, no, yeah, I think that's a really great idea. And the first thing I'm thinking of is just like, the OKD and OCP are fairly identical in that regard, so OCP ought to, should have something, right? I'm sure somebody's written something by now. Basic troubleshooting steps in like a KB article somewhere. We could pull that yeah. and adapt it as the first step. I think there are knowledge base articles. It's not in the product doc, but this, you know, honestly, it's interesting. This is a problem that I think affects both OCP and OKD, because the nature of the upgrade questions that I see come across the OKD channel in some ways parallels questions that we get from customers who are getting stuck in the same upgrade positions. Now, to your question, unfortunately, we don't have like a great piece of public documentation that I've seen. I've just seen it come up on a case by case basis where they recommend, you know, KCS articles. Like the one that comes to mind for me is like, this seems to happen a lot. Uh, people change vCenters and then want to migrate their OpenShift from one to the other and like, all the VM names change or something like that, and it becomes a massive, you know, pain in the butt. And this is like something that I know customers have deal dealt with and also, you know, community members, but I've only seen like a KCS article about it. I haven't seen like an official, like here's a massive like workbook for update issues. So I think like having something like that, especially if it came from the community would be like tremendous. I think it'd be amazing. 
Oh, and it doesn't have to be like very detailed, like just something that says, hey, go to cluster version operator and look at the logs. Because so many times there's logs in there that say, you know, that it can't spin up such and such pods or whatever. And that's a good place to start. C can we, maybe we should just create a doc um, and the docs group can take this up that just starts to collate links to various places and maybe well, small, <clears throat> small snippets. I was going to say, do, do we want to create a discussion thread on the oh, OpenShift yeah. forum? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to pull it together and collate it into documentation if people are then willing to review it. And So and, on the OKD and, repo, on the new repo, or what do you, where do you want to do it? We haven't shifted really. So the discussion mm -hmm. forum is still currently OpenShift slash OKD. Okay, sure. So let, let's go there. At some okay. point, we do have to have a migration strategy. Um, because we've got the new OKD project organization. So at some point we do need to have a migration strategy because obviously the, the OKD.io site has to move across. <clears throat> the support mechanism has to move across with the discussion forums. So we probably do need to have a planned migration rather than. Yeah, I think um, we'll tackle that or at least begin to tackle that yeah. at the next docs meeting next. Sure. Okay. All right. Anything else so, on the? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Could I was just gonna make one more comment, like on this. You know, talking about like PRs, people could open and stuff like that. Um, I know some of the project teams have begun work on creating like troubleshooting docs inside the various different component repositories. Like our team has been trying to do this. I've seen a couple others doing it. That's probably another area where I think like PRs would be welcome. You know, like if we have community members who have figured out how to troubleshoot something on like a various, you know, whatever, like a networking component or something, like opening a PR to suggest changes to the troubleshooting jock or even to like start a troubleshooting doc, like I think that that's like a tremendous uh, value that could be added. So if people are kind of figure that stuff out and they wanna make a PR, but they're not sure where to go, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to help like direct people or if we need guidance on how to put that together, like I'm happy to get involved as well. So just so another there are kind of two layers here, right? One is it's broken. Where do I go to find out which component is broken? And then once I know which component is broken, that's great to link to those component specific docs. Exactly, exactly. Um, I also just want to point out that there's a lot of overlap between upgrade troubleshooting and initial install troubleshooting in that the cluster is in a state, how do I find out which component is failing so that I can get to the next steps of, of troubleshooting that component. Um, I, I suspect a lot, the, a lot of the docs will apply to both, but, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Like basically, yes, maybe you look in a different initial log to figure out what's broken, but then everything after that is, oh, this thing fails in this way, and that's the same for both. I think you're right, Daniel. I think there probably will be a lot of very similar advice. And I, I agree that we don't currently have great debugging documentation. Like, how do I debug things? It's, it's mostly, as I think Mike said, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, like somebody will find the, the right knowledge base article and link that out to the customer or, or whoever requested that info, but it's never really like, let's round up all the necessary info. It's even even like when you debug some CI failures, like what there's the must gather, what do I look at first? We There is a lot of documentation internally, but it's not like we have one canonical place store that, and this is how you would debug OpenShift, at least I'm not aware of it. So I would yeah. very much um, like to, to at least participate in, in creating uh, that uh, that information. And I know that uh, Mike has been absolutely instrumental to creating some of the best documentation I've, I've seen in the past, which is the provider onboarding docs, which kind of leads into this. It's more of from the development side. Um, but yeah, and, and we're now working on, on more of, of like on the continuation of this internally. So, um, yeah, if I can help with any of that, um, I, I'm very happy to do that. And I will try to raise that topic specifically of, of like debugging document, documentation for debugging specifically, and maybe making that an, an open place instead of like the 
knowledge base uh, article, which is always behind the uh, the login. Which I yeah. I don't think it's a paywall. It might be in some cases. I I'm not sure. So it, no, it's not, not paywall, but you do need your account. Yeah. So yeah. It, it you know I, I just love these. I, I look at the repo and not not the actual website, and uh, I, that's what I prefer for all. So you touched on something wow. interesting that I had suggested a while back, but we never followed up on it, which is a a, a guide to must gather. What what is must gather? Where would you start looking in a must gather to to follow the process of of an install or a boot or anything like that? I think that is something that I've not seen anywhere externally, and I I think it would benefit because we always ask people to provide one. So they're there, and and multiple people could look at it, um, but we don't um, help people figure out like what do you what would you do with it if you wanted to help troubleshoot when someone posts their must gather. I, I think that's a really poignant uh, point there, <laughs> uh, Jamie. Like the must gathers, like it is just kind of a collection of data, and there's kind of this tribal knowledge about what's in there, and then like depending on what component you're looking at, you kind of know where to go. But there are also a couple tools that we should highlight. Um, there's one called O Must Gather. There's like a, another version of that O Must Gather tool. And I've also got a tool that I've been working on. Um, and like O Must Gather gives you like an OC interface to a Must Gather. So like you unzip, you untar a Must Gather and you point this tool at it. And all of a sudden you can do like OMG git pods and it'll show you, you know, so you can interact with the Must Gather as if it were a cluster. And then, you know, the tool that I've been working on is like a, a web interface. So like it creates a static web page for you from a must gather that highlights where problem areas are happening. And like, so you can just directly go to those um, records and just look at them immediately. So I think like, yeah, sharing some of these tools is probably, you know, probably helpful as well, because those are the main ways that we interact with these things. Where is this tool that you're creating, man? You've been holding out on us. Um, yeah, well, I, I actually had been working to get it into um, our CI system so that it would be available everywhere. Um, so that is the first version of the tool I wrote. It's a Python application, but I'm actually rewriting it in Rust now so that I can bundle it as a binary that will get included in the CI package. So like if you want to if you want to see where the new version is at and I'm, and I'm almost done with my rewrite. Um, so if anybody is into Rust and wants to help out, that's where the new version is going to be at. But like, but yeah, so like I think that looking at must gathers through the lens of the tooling that we've created to like understand them is actually probably like the biggest step up to figuring out like what do you want out of a must gather, you know? Excellent. This is cool. And I'm putting all these links in the uh, meeting minutes as well. Yeah, if you don't mind me sharing one more link, there was another, when the testing topic came up before, there was one more thing I wanted to share with you all. And I, this is going to be kind of out there, but I know this group likes to get kind of out there sometimes. Um, <laughs> so this is a tool that one of our engineers has created internally. Um, Richard Vanderpool is the engineer who created this. And he created it as a tool to help with some of our partner interactions where people are trying to get the release repository, which controls our prow, like testing and everything. They're trying to do like mock-ups of tests and whatnot. And this tool will allow you to kind of, to do some of those release-based prow mock-ups on like a local cluster. So I know like, this is really far out there, but like if you're, if you're getting into thinking about how to create like CI infrastructures or how to use the current Red Hat CI infrastructure to replicate tests, I think this is an interesting tool to look at because it will allow you to take the release repository and then run specific tests out of it, like against a local cluster. So you can build like almost a mini version of your own CI infrastructure. It doesn't actually run Prow and all those other things, but it kind of shortcuts some of that process for you. Um, so I know like John, I know you're, you're like deep into some of this stuff. So it might be, you know, this might be something yeah, that, that would be interesting. interesting of the work. Yeah, especially as people start to think about putting PRs up that might change the prow configurations and whatnot. This is another tool that just gives a window into like how we're doing things. Excellent. This is great. I, I just want to second that this has been super useful. Uh, Richard is my team lead. Uh, we're on the specialist platform team. He's the team lead there. 
and so we, we we've been using that tool from time to time and it's yeah it, it, it's been proven very useful to us and especially if you don't want to deal with all this complexity of pro you just want to consume whatever is in the release repository pro is essentially a runner for uh, kubernetes jobs and this will just create the job for you that you want and it'll run it locally in a kind cluster and it's yeah it's it's super useful and yeah great bringing that up uh, thank you so much michael for that for that um i i think because our our ci system is super complex uh we, we don't have to lie about that it's it's you know <laughs> not not trivial and this makes it actually very easy to just do one thing and focus on one thing and then you can upstream that into the proper pro config um after testing your changes locally so that really yeah i think for even trying the concept of pro or our CI system, which is also the OKD build system, we essentially reuse our CI system for OKD as a build system, or you could turn it the other way around. Our build system is also the CI system for, for our product. Um, but yeah, th this is super helpful. And we've used it in our team and it's, it's really great. Excellent. Well, I wanna move on because we've got about nine minutes left and, and a couple more things, but um, if folks have any more comments or suggestions for stuff, um, Brian's going to create the um, discussion thread, uh, and then folks can chip in on that. And Christian will make sure that you know where that is, so you can add any additional stuff. Um, so moving on, we've got uh, two issues that folks wanted to to talk about. Um, so who put up the Ce the Seth Rook? John, was that you? Uh, uh, yeah. I did, but John oh, okay. and I both yeah. run into it. Oh so. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Take it. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, John and I both run into this issue where there is some, it looks it looks to me to be an SE Linux thing, but I can't say for sure. But for whatever reason, um, with the release of FCOS Fedora Core OS 35 that is underneath OKD 4.10, this latest release, uh, CephFS mounts just do not work anymore. And that seems to be impacting anybody, anything who is running Ceph within their cluster or trying to mount CephFS into their cluster from an external place. Like I personally, I'm running Rook in my cluster and all of my CephFS mounts are basically broken at this point, notably including the image registry, which is how I noticed um, because my builds weren't working anymore and that was a pain. Um, block mounts still work, which makes it really weird. Um, I'm not an SE Linux expert. Uh, John very kindly figured it out before me and like, you know, filed a bugzilla with FCOS upstream, but I don't think anyone has looked at it. And so I wanted to take advantage of being in the same call as Timothy, if he's still around, to, uh, you know, bring that up and also raise awareness within everyone else, just in case they see issues like that coming up. Yeah, that's actually right, so on he's my... Gonna, he's taking a look right now, so... Yeah, that's on my list to uh, look at more closely next week. Um, Agreed. I think it probably is a SC Linux thing, but that's been lower on my priority list than the than the build stoppers. I'm gonna For so sure. while Timothy is looking at this, I want to quickly get to this. We've got like seven minutes left. I wanted to get this user posted in the chat and also in as an issue, and I don't know that this was ever resolved. So network policy deny all policy does not correctly restrict traffic to a pod when using node ports. Uh, so within that node, does anyone know if that's correct? Or if that is, is that a known bug or is that expected behavior? There was some discussion about this, about how deny all policy works. Anyone have any thoughts on that? I've heard weird things about the node ports. I mean, this sounds like something that might fit in. With okay. Yeah, yeah, we just we just went through an issue about like restricting traffic to metadata services and whatnot, and I th I remember that there was a an angle to it where a pod that has host port path was not getting restricted through. Well, let me let me back that up. If if a pod has host port path on the node, the node wasn't getting restricted, so traffic from the node would go out, but other nodes that had previously oh. restricted the host path stopped doing it. Yeah, so I think that's right. very and that's simple. actually what we're seeing. That's what the comment was from this user. So, 
Okay, so it's like the same thing, basically. Right. Yeah. All right. One of those so, weird things. I've noticed OVN Cube has a couple of just weird corners you wouldn't expect. So I ran into a thing a few months ago about a external traffic policy. Just like some part, like one of the one of the policies just wasn't implemented, and I tracked it down to a bug, and I was just like, well, all right, I'll wait. Is it the default yeah. now in OCP and OK? I know in OKD it's the default now, but um, is OVN Cube default in OCP now? I'm not sure if it is. Uh, okay, Timothy, did you have a response real quick? We've got like five minutes left. <laughs> My response is that if uh, it's not an issue in the Fedora Core tracker, uh, Fedora Core developer won't see it. So. I would say the first step is to make an issue there. Oh, it sure was we, not made actually on GitHub. Yeah. Okay. So, so here, here's, yeah. here's my, uh, I'm going to call it a beef, but I mean that tongue in cheek. Um, we've been told over and over that we're supposed to be using Bugzilla for reporting, you know, pretty much any type of bugs. I, I do most of the time for something significant. So, you know, I opened Bugzilla. Shouldn't the Fedora folks be, you know, getting stuff from Bugzilla in order to see this, because having to do two things, having to do Bugzilla and then having to go do something someplace else, it, it's... <laughs> what is the correct way? Yeah, what is the right way? Because we yeah. seem to have multiple different ways of reporting bugs, and it's... it's because. The MCO team, you know, you open up an issue in the MCO, and they're like, well, you're supposed to open up a Bugzilla. Like, uh, okay, which way are we supposed to do it? <laughs> yes. So that's that's the thing. That's the thing that is difficult is as we have a mix of products and uh, community, and so different things to re different places to report different things, depending on which side uh, of the contract you're on. And so essentially, <laughs> Fedora Cores is a community project. And unfortunately, we do not use Bugzilla as the rest of Fedora. We use the GitHub issue tracker. So anything that is related to Fedora Cores itself is best reported into the Fedora Cores tracker. No, if you have something that is OCP based, OCP is a product. So essentially, if you want to have this thing fixed, you need to report Bugzilla because that's where OCP bugs are. But don't worry, we are in the progress of changing that too. So <laughs> this is changing soon. I gonna I don't know how much of this is public, but it's not really Timothy, it's all bad. You should all feel bad. This is pretty terrible. Please I don't care. I'm trying to explain things. you what the state is. I'm not responsible for it. So just try to explain <laughs> things. So yeah. So Bugzilla is probably soon at some point going away and uh, everything will be Jira based at some point, but yeah. Hooray, Jira, just in time Yay. for them to go down. I use Jira at work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so let's... Whatever, so if you, yeah, okay. yeah, if you want to get right now an issue, if you want to get right now an issue into the attention yeah. of Federal Correct, folks, put it in the GitHub issues. Yeah, I mean it's actually probably a Fedora issue rather than a than an FCOS. Yeah, yeah, so it's easier. Some, somebody will figure it out. It's it's easier if you get it somewhere here, and yeah. then usually we can track the fixes landing somewhere and things like that. Yeah, all right, I'll uh, I'll put that in today. Okay. I, I think so... this is this issue is particularly difficult because it was reported on the OKD it tracker, and we usually say Bugzilla, but then we. The F cos requires the special. Let's move it to GitHub to the CentOS Dora CoreOS tracker repo, um, which is a, a, a bit of a special process um, for us. But yeah, so this is I think entirely our fault um, internally in, in in OKD, not not F cos folks. And I think the the Bugzilla is perfectly assigned to uh, to Tef in Fedora. But yes, that's still the, the project release, so they might not be looking at that um, quickly. And uh, yeah, I think opening it on the Fedora tracker, the, the FCOS folks really do a great job in, in reminding people uh, in, in their respective teams uh, to look at things because they require those changes. 
much better than we do in, in, in OKD maybe, where we just have kind of the OpenShift arc as our focus, whereas everything else is just like, put it on Fedora and, and they'll fix it. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know. uh, if you can reproduce this bug on a uh, Fedora Core S node uh, by itself, not it's not directly, not fully on an OKD cluster, it makes it even easier for us to debug and uh, even more likely that you will get a fix. Excellent. Let's tell you well, what it might be able to actually use yes, because I think it is SC Linux, but I yeah. haven't had a chance to debug into it further. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll be mindful of people's time. In. So let's, yeah, for, if the three of you could work together um, to get it to the right place, that would be awesome. All right, three last things. CRC, we've gotten a slew of C OKD CRC questions uh, the past couple days. Um, so I, CRC is still somewhat viable, I think, until um, Microshift sort of um, covers more ground. So we can put out a call for folks to build CRC and maybe play with CRC a little bit so we can improve the documentation. That would be helpful. Documentation group is going to take this up. So if you know anyone that wants to build CRC, um, Charo left some great instructions on how to do it. It's not that hard, and we talked about automating it. Um, survey, I've been reaching out to Driti, and she has not responded. So our survey is still in limbo. We might have to recreate it because I don't have a link to the materials that she was working on. But I do think we should do the survey to get a sense of OKD usage. Um, and then last thing is uh, there will be an email sent out for vote for the subcommittee co-chair. So look for that. Um, Sandro, I think, will be, you know, is has thrown his name in for um, the virtualization, the OKZ, vir, OKD virtualization subgroup. Um, you know, and folks uh, and various other subgroups will, f folks can throw their hats in and stuff like that. So look forward to an email on. Any last minute things before we um, close up here? Awesome, just a few minutes over. Thanks folks. Um, look for this uh, meeting video to be up relatively soon and the notes to be up as a web page. Great meeting, talk to you soon. All right, later. Thanks, Thanks for watching us, Jamie. Bye everybody.